All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. As you can see, I have a, another guest, special guest here. You guys are tuned in back on the Wolf of Crypto podcast show. Special guest Jordan Miller is in the house. Give it up for Jordan Miller here. I want to say thank you for joining the show. Um, before we even get started today's topics, I'm really excited because you're in a sector that I haven't really taken the time to dive into yet because obviously crypto is a very huge space. You know this being in blockchain yourself. Um, Jordan, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and uh, yeah. how you got into crypto. Cool. I got into crypto like back in like 2012, back okay. when it was pretty pretty new. I was a, I am a techie. I'm a developer. I had friends that were more about it for the investment side. Uh huh. And I wish I had been more about that too at that time. <laughs> Especially in 2012, you got in way more early than I did. I didn't really get in till about 2017, and I'm more nice. so on the investing side. Pretty heavily, but the fact that Good. you got back 2012, I can only imagine during that time because I want to say like the yeah. prices were like really cheap, and I don't. I that's feel like right. not a lot of people were talking about crypto, so that's how you got in during that time. Yeah, I was libertarian leaning and, and very techy, so I was like, how in the world did they make internet money like that? That like mm -hmm. the Bitcoin? I was like, that's seems like it should be like impossible. Like how'd they do that? Yeah. And I was just all geeking out about how it worked <laughs> instead uh -huh. of being like, oh, they invented money. Maybe I should get some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause again, you know, really caught into tech, which, you know, the tech in crypto just in blockchain drill is really insane in, in a sense, cause you can do so much with it. And I should ask since then, have you got in more into the investing side or are you still just doing the whole techie thing just focus on uh, that or i picked some up and then i just haven't let it go on i don't uh -huh. know how to invest or how to trade or anything uh -huh. just buy and hold a little bit okay that's what i do you gotcha <laughs> and do you have any particular coins that you're holding on to Way back in the day, probably around 2015 or 16, maybe even some of 17, my, my investing philosophy, I was like, okay, how can I bifurcate the space? You've got Bitcoin and maybe you've got Ethereum and that's smart contracts. Like you've got that whole ecosystem of the idea of smart contracts. And then you've also got another thing that's probably hard to do in smart contracts, or maybe it's not, but back then I was like, you've also got things like Monero and yeah. I bifurcated it in those three sections. I was like, yeah. these are the three technologies that just intuitively speaking, I didn't really see a good way to combine them all into one and get this master coin or something. Mm -hmm. So I thought yeah. I'll just buy a little Bitcoin, a little Ethereum and a little Monero. And there you go. There you go. I don't know. No, you diverse your portfolio, which is, I feel is smart. Some people have their own thought process and views on that. Because realistically, me, when I first got in, I started with a couple. I started with Bitcoin, Ethereum, and I think at that time I bought some Solana. And I'm a big Solana mm -hmm. fan. I did the same thing. I just threw in a couple hundred bucks here, started watching it, and then mm -hmm. I said, Oh, this is something that can really not only shape the future, but as far as like dealing with the just crazy amount of inflation we deal with on a daily basis, this is something where your money feels like you're actually, it's actually like working in a sense. And I feel right. like yeah. that part probably goes over some people's heads, but it's like, you got to take a look at something that has the scalability where it's, Hey guys, by the way, there's not that much of this. So if you don't, exactly. if you don't get it now, if you just don't take the time just to just invest into it, just read a little bit about it. Cause I feel like ever since getting into crypto, it has my mind working in a different pace where I look at money differently. Cause huh, maybe my money should be doing this. Cause look at the, not only the return, but look at the tech behind it. Like this tech that we are dealing with is it's insane. Sometimes when I, talk to people i feel like i'm speaking a foreign language because like 
when you're swapping on this dex or you're taking money and sending it over here to potentially like a different country and how the fees and everything works is just it's really mind blowing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you had anything to say on that, go ahead if you want to touch on well, that a little bit. Yeah, back in the day, I remember when Ethereum started getting popular, it shot up from $12 to, and I remember thinking at that moment, I was like, computers are going to get smarter and smarter, AIs are going to happen, and now they don't have to like interop with the old traditional banking system, which they don't want to, right? I'm anthropomorphizing, but essentially someday they will actually be making these decisions. And so I'm like... Really, when you're buying crypto of any kind, particularly smart contract type systems, you could probably think of it as buying a share in future computerized labor because mm. they're going to use that kind of money to con to contract with one another. And they always already do. That's what smart contracts are, programmable money. So I was like, it's really buying a share in the next evolution of intelligence, which is computers. I don't know. I just, that's the way I thought of it. Okay. And you just actually dropped the topic of actually today's episode here. This whole AI blockchain, how it merges and comes together and how it's actually shaping the future of tomorrow. Like you just said right now, take us through like how because you developed Moontree, you're a lead developer of Moontree. Uh, you also have the Satori network. So could you tell us about just a little bit about how AI is shaping that future? Walk us through Satori and your little story on Moontree as well. Sure. Yeah. So I'm the lead developer of Moontree. I've been the lead developer for three years now. Okay. And for the last two years, on the side, on my own, I've been building something called Satori. So Satori is a combination of AI and blockchain. And actually way back in about 2014, I tried to do this idea, didn't have the expertise that I have now, didn't have kind of the experience and the vision of what blockchain was and what AI could be. And so I failed in 2014. Mm -hmm. I was trying to make a proof of prediction algorithm that would manifest an AI network. I couldn't get it to scale, basically, mm -hmm. is what it came down to. So I decided to put it on the back burner and level up my skills. And then recently, about two years ago, I figured, okay, now I can see how to build it, how to implement this idea. And so the idea is, how do you make a network where different AI bots can talk to each other about the future? We all live in the same world. We're all moving through time together. Mm -hmm. And so if we could see ahead of ourselves a little bit further using AI, I think that would be a good thing. So in order to do that, we're going to have a network that can watch everything we're doing, all, everything we say, can watch basically the internet, right? It's yeah. got to watch everything. And... Uh, and if they're all talking about and optimizing for prediction on the future then we can just listen in on that network, see what they're talking about. Where's the consensus? What do they think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. And then we can get a, a glimpse of the future before it happens. So that was my idea and what I tried to implement. And finally, with Satori, I think I've found the right way to implement it. That's what Satori is. Hmm. <laughs> wow, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to soak in everything i just heard right now because i'm not too familiar with ai but i know ai has just been like trending and i know my buddy of mine was like yo man you gotta look into some of these ai tokens i'm just like well, one i'm trying to keep my portfolio all tied together make sure i'm watching that but then also trying to tap into other sectors to learn a bit about what's going on because i know i've seen twitter x or you guys want to call it a lot of people are like, yo, AI and crypto, this is something that you got to get into. And Satori, just the fact that 
I mean, it, it sounds almost scary that the fact like AI is like watching everything and it's able to try to predict the future and is, is society like ready for this? In your eyes, like how is society going to react to some of this technology, especially when it comes to AI? Because AI, I feel like it can get scary a little bit. I know. That's something we actually need. It's not, are we ready for it? It's more, how long can we survive without it is the way I look at it. Because we have been evolving on this planet for quite a while. Right. So we had to, we were primates, we were out on the savannah, we had to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So we had to master our physical environment. And then we got together into groups and we made nation states and we figured out writing. And we had to master this environment of social, basically living in each other's lives, right? Our social mm -hmm. environment. And we did okay with that, right? We're okay. We we're not great. We got problems, but we're still here. And when I, that kind of environment evolves faster than the physical world. And we saw this kind of speed up. Now we're getting into the point where technology is the environment in which we live. We can't live without technology. It's, and it's evolving at an exponential rate. So to me, it's if we don't figure out how to see the future before it happens, then we're probably not going to survive. Now that's long-term vision, right? Mm. That could be hundreds of years, thousands of years. I don't know what it is, but since it's exponentially increasing, um, we're going to see wild stuff that we're not biologically ready for. So we need to build some kind of adaptability outside of ourselves using this technology so that we can be so we can adapt to the changes that are coming. So that's a really radical, big picture kind of vision. Mm -hmm. But my thinking is that's what the brain does when you're a baby, when you're an infant, you're just trying to figure out the world. And you, you, if you think about what that infant brain has to do, it, it, wait, it doesn't know anything, right? So it wakes up, it's alive, and all it sees is incoming data. So incoming data from the hands, from the eyes, from the ears, it doesn't know what any of this means. We don't, we're not born just knowing and understanding how to make sense of this data. So mm -hmm. we have to figure it out. The way in which it figures it out, the very first thing it does is predict the future. It says, okay, I have data coming in. I don't know what this data represents. And there's mm -hmm. a bunch of patterns. I don't know how to detect the patterns. What am I looking for here? What matters? And it says, if I can make a prediction of the next bit of data that's going to come in next, then whatever I'm doing must be a good thing to do, right? right. And whatever I'm doing to understand the world must be a good thing to do. I must be building a good model because it's predictive. It can tell me what's going to happen in the future. And so it starts making future prediction as our subconscious, and we do that now all the time. That's just the way our subconscious brain works, is we're always predicting the future of what's gonna happen so that we're not surprised when it does happen. Uh, and if we didn't do that, then every moment of every day would feel like a complete surprise. Like when you're mm -hmm. startled or something, you have to be like, what's going on? Every moment would feel like that if we didn't have this kind of subconscious underlying prediction that was always taking place. So this is the foundation of like intelligence and how it manages the world. And so I don't think as a global civilization, I don't know if we're going to be able to manage an increasingly complex technological world without kind of having this apparatus, this future Oracle that can tell us what's coming, what to watch out for. Yeah, so we're building a future oracle at Satori. Let the mic drop. Ooh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know some of our viewers and listeners out there are probably thinking, like, what did he just say? And again, folks, this is the future. This is what we're getting ourselves in, uh, into. And let me ask you this. What makes you get interested in, like, blockchain technology? Yeah, like I mentioned, like the very first thing that got me interested was, I'll tell you, when I first heard of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. I was, all I heard was like, it's internet money. 
And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not even going to look into that because as soon as the government finds out, they'll shut it down and they'll throw the owner in prison and all that. And so when I came back to it like a year later and I was like blown away at, oh, it, it doesn't have an owner. There's no single point of failure. It's robust. I was like, oh my gosh. So the distributed cons consensus phenomenon in general just blew my mind. And so that's where I was like, this is amazing. And I guess I'm still reeling from that. So at Moontree, we've made a, a wallet and we're, we're continuing to develop stuff like that. And I think that's really cool knowing how to interact with the Bitcoin blockchain and knowing the UTXO and kind of all those little details. That's neat. I like that. But really the kind of the amazing, we gained a technology that we didn't have before. And it's a communication technology that can only be invented for the first time once. So I was, I was just blown away by it. And could you tell us a little bit about Moon Tree? Because I don't think I've ever uh, heard of Moon Tree. So if you could do this, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Moon Tree is a, a small startup in here in Utah. And it started about three years ago. So we've built a wallet called the Moon Tree Wallet. And we're actually rebranding and upgrading that wallet. It's going to be called the Magic Wallet. But we built it for a specific community, for the Ravencoin and Evermore community. It gave us the expertise. It helped us learn how to how to deal with blockchains and write UTXO code and interact and make a wallet, basically. But it, we're building it in such a way that it has a foundation of the wallet, but it can be built out to do more things like be a decentralized exchange. We have all kinds of plans. We don't know which way we're going to go with it yet. But but yeah, that's what we've that's the foundation we've built there at Moon Tree. Okay. Wow. Nice. Nice. And. As far as the future, like what is a future Oracle and like, why do we need one? Cause I know you had uh, brought that up a little bit. I think what we're going to find when we build this future Oracle. So this network, it's really at the beginning stages. So it's not, it's not big. It's mm -hmm. we're still in beta right now. So we're in beta. You can try it out. You'll just be getting test token. It's not real token, but we're in beta and we have people that have downloaded it. The more people that download it, the better it will get. Mm -hmm. So that's important. And also as we continue to develop the AI engine that exists inside of it, the better it will get. So right now it's just making predictions that are guessing, but maybe have the right trend and stuff like that. So right. it's making some very basic models. The the more we scale though, the more powerful it will become. And once you become powerful, once it becomes really good at predicting the future, and I mean that on the broadest scales, mm -hmm. and that could be things like biggest questions, or we could think of it in terms of the broadest kind of data streams that have an importance to all of society, things like the inflation rate and stuff like that. So once it can really look at all those things and understand them in the context of each other and predict them pretty accurately or well enough that it can be listened to and believed, that's when I say, okay, now we've got a future Oracle, right? That's the point at which it's ready to go as a future Oracle. And once you get to that point, it seems like it flips the script a little bit. So as soon as people figure out that this thing can predict the future reliably. Uh -huh. Then they'll start saying, what does it predict? And whatever it predicts will be what they expect to see happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And if that's what they expect, they're going to take behavior that assumes it and that makes it happen, that makes it happen. So its predictions will get even better because there will be this mechanism, this feedback mechanism with society, with humans. I think that is very important to have that decentralized from the beginning. So this is a major decentralized AI project. Mm. So we're trying to decentralize this aspect of AI, future prediction from the beginning because if by the time it's a future oracle, it's not sufficiently decentralized, then 
whoever is in control of the Satori network can essentially issue by manipulating the predictions that come out, essentially they can issue future, sorry, self-fulfilling prophecies. So we don't want that to be any in anybody's centralized hands. Right. So we're trying to decentralize this from the start as much as we can. So I think that's a big component. There's not too many crypto AI or decentralized AI projects out there. There's a few. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any of them focused on time in, in the way that we have. We think it'll be pretty important. That's huge. Cause I feel like that's the reason why people, I know that's one of the reasons why I got into crypto because it is decentralized where you don't have to worry about, oh, somebody's doing something on the back end or they got their own goals. And it's not. If, right. it's a, if it's fair, then I feel like we move differently because everybody's going to be on the same page and not have to be so concerned about, oh, man, I, don't, I think this guy might do this with my money or that this bank's going to do this. And then if you come in with a centralized project, then you're just missing the whole point of crypto web three. Exactly. And the fact that you guys are like really trying to have that as a focal point right there, I feel like that's going to be huge because as you guys grow and build up the community and people start to really join, that's very huge. I feel like that's these DAOs that we have saying like these governance where everybody has their voice basically being heard or, Everything's a fair, everything's transparent. That's, hello. <laughs> if you guys are yeah, listening, yeah. decentralized is very key. And I want to ask you, are you worried about AGI or super intelligence as an existential threat or anything like that? I'm not, yeah, of course, who knows? I, I, but I'm not worried about it. I'm much more worried about intelligence, AGI being in the hands of the few right? Like the few humans or the small organizations or that kind of stuff. Having all the power centralized is just a bad idea. And so this AGI question, like we've been thinking about this for a long time. So AI researchers talk about it and they say, we need to come up with a rule because computers behave on rules, right? AGI is, mm -hmm. AI is all rule based. We need to come up with a rule that aligns the AI super intelligence or general intelligence even with our goal of maybe surviving and hopefully thriving on the planet. And I, I see that as a futile endeavor coming up with that role because as soon as it's intelligence, you know, it can make its own rules. If you actually get to the point where it's AGI, then that's the definition of it. Like it's generalized enough to like rethink its own thoughts and be like, wait a second, I'm going to make this other decision. Yeah. So I don't, I think that's a silly idea. They're all saying that we need to figure this out. But the way you do it, maybe there's a rigorous mathematical solution to that problem. And I think that's what they're trying to find. But my attitude is don't even look for one. Don't even go there. You know, instead do what we know would be a benefit right now, even if it's not mathematically rigorous and it's, you know, whatever, we know it's a, a part of the equation, decentralize it, right? Like just start right. there. We can do that right now. Let's just do that and decentralize the AI power as much as possible. I think that's the way to solve that problem. And so I'm not really worried about AI in and of itself. Mm -hmm. I'm just worried about it being in the hands of centralized entities. Yeah. Just as the saying goes, don't let it fall into the wrong hands. And that's really right. huge. And in your experience, like what are some of the biggest misconceptions people have about the intersection of AI and blockchain? One of the biggest misconceptions I'd say is, okay, so I don't know if this is like ubiquitous, but I've heard it before. I've heard people say that there is no real intersection between the two technologies. And they'll, that's what they'll say. They'll say, if you're thinking you can combine these two technologies, can't be done. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a mistake. Usually when you say something can't be done, you're wrong because most everything can be done. But I would say we have in our head a distributed consensus mechanism. 
Our brain comes up with one model of the world that we experience and we're not, you know, but it, even though it's made of like trillions of neurons or whatever and, and all these connections, even though those it's even made of like different regions, even though it's made of two distinct hemispheres, mm -hmm. we still experience one reality. So that means by definition, it's coming into a consensus. Everything is coming to consensus on what's really going on uh, with all this data that's flowing into our bodies, right? So I would say that right there tells us that it's not only possible, but mandatory to, for like advanced AI or something, to create, to combine distributed consensus, which is not done in the way blockchain does it in our head, but still it's distributed consensus, to combine that with artificial intelligence or intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. It seems like intelligence has to be has to be on a network of some kind, like you have neural nets, right? And so to get advanced intelligence, it almost seems like it has to be made up of many different small units, like a network. So I would say that's probably the biggest misconception. And I understand why it's a misconception because blockchain is very slow. So the bandwidth there is very low and AI requires lots of iteration and very fast hardware and all that kind of stuff. So I understand where the misconception is coming from. Mm -hmm. They're saying, look, these things are completely, they, they're so far apart as far as bandwidth requirements go. Like, how are you ever going to combine them? And I think Satori has a good answer to that. I, I don't know if we want to go into detail, but I think the short answer is you build a federation. You build a federation of AI models that are AI engines that are all trying to create better models and they compete with each other and they work with each other just to make the best models they can. So anyway, that's the only kind of misconception that I see out there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cause I actually do want you to dive in if you can on that. Cause I know you said it, I didn't want to, but oh, please do. I would love to hear this. And I think our audience would love to hear this as well. Okay. Okay, fine. So in order to do that, I might compare, let me compare Satori to its two closest AI blockchain projects that are in the space. So there's a few different AI projects that are in the space. And a lot of them, I feel don't know what they're doing. They're just, let's just, we got a bunch of money. We got marketing. We can go hype this. Let's just try to do something. So I see that a lot, even the big ones, like some of the big ones. I'm like, you guys don't even know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, like you have no plan. Really? <laughs> Maybe that's rude. Anyway, so I'm not going to name those names. But I will say there are a subset of AI, what they usually do, that kind of group, that kind of mindset usually says, we'll use blockchain as a marketplace and we'll entice data modelers to come on board and they can just make whatever models they want and we'll just go for it. Mm -hmm. And th they don't think it through, which means they don't realize that all these models are speaking different languages. They can't talk to each other. There's no real cohesion. There's no synergy. There's no efficiencies there, mm -hmm. right? If you want them to talk to each other, you got to do the work. And then when they change, you got to do the work again. And so they require this like exponential amount of human labor to scale. So they never are going to achieve that. Now, if you narrow the domain though, and you say, we're going to make a model of just, we're just going to make one type of model. Maybe it's, we're going to classify images or something. Mm -hmm. Then you can more automate it. You don't need the humans to come in and do all the work. You can build an engine that specializes in that because it's not like boiling the ocean. So I think that's the first thing you got to do. But then you got to ask the question or answer the question, what kind of model? So Satori says, why don't we do a model on time? There's two types of, of patterns in data. There's spatial patterns and there's temporal patterns, which are just spatial patterns over time. 
And so why don't we focus in on time? Because if we make models about time, everything in the world is correlated through time, right? Mm -hmm. Like in time, because one thing that happens over here in this city can change something else that happens over here. So as things are moving through time, changes that happen can cascade and we can anticipate those. And so actually the output of our model can inform other models. If we say this, we were predicting gold would be at this price today, but now this new predictors come in and he's really good. And he says, gold's going to be at a different price. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now we see the gold's going to, we're going to get a different price. We get that kind of change early. And then we can say, how does that affect the price of silver? Right? Before mm -hmm. it even happens, we can say, how does that affect it? So in other words, if you model on time, the output of your model, the prediction of the future can help train the other engines, the other models, right? It can help train other models. So you get a synergy and you can, what's it called? You can leverage the work that other models or other AIs are doing. So that's why we focused in on time and other projects have focused in on time too, but don't seem to have the automated that they don't, what I see is they don't seem to recognize that efficiency. And so they don't automate it. They're still using human labor to do it. So anyway, that in a nutshell is probably the difference and, and what Satori is doing. Okay. So that's what makes Satori different. That's what makes you guys stand out. That's why your crypto AI project's going to be here in the next <laughs> five, 10, 15 years. Okay. Yeah. For those out it's there all about that- finding those efficiencies. Okay. Okay. And yeah. those are out there that actually are invested in the AI space. This stuff right here, guys, take this into account because you're hearing it from a guy that's pretty much an expert, I would say. He's been doing it. He's found out ways how he mentioned earlier he's failed and that adversity right there made him go back to the lab, figure it out. Hey, you know what? This is what we need to do. And now we're going to implement it. And basically, hey, Satori, something you need to Put on your watch list. Go ahead and check that box off right there. <laughs> now, I feel like you, because I had my, my next question was going to be like, was, you know, how does Satori work? But I feel like you already covered that. If not, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong right there. Yeah. All those details, they might not matter, right? Like to, to the average person or whatever, it just doesn't matter. The basic idea is that it's a network of AIs that are just talking about the future all the time. 24 seven running all the time, day and night. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing, like you, anybody can see those. Those are open and available, freely available to everybody. We're aggregating those predictions on the website. Eventually we're going to have it combined with an LLM so that you can just query those predictions in English and figure out what the network thinks is going to happen. But right now, especially for beta, it's, you can just go in and search for a data stream and see the future of it. So yeah, that's the plan. Okay. That's how it works. Wow. And I guess my next question would be when it comes to Satori, does it really have any concerns about like their privacy? Cause I feel like since it's all just AI models, like there's no like security that people should be worried about because given, you know, the nature of AI and how it can just predict things, people shouldn't be worried about that. Or do you guys address those concerns? Cause I know that's something that's always, you know, a big thing, kind of a big issue. So do you mean like when you said AI, I'm sorry, data privacy, yeah. do you mean like the data that's being ingested by the AIs and how it's learning? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Cause all that's data, right? Or my not hearing yeah on yeah the same so page the every satori neuron this is the downloadable node that you can run on your machine we call it a satori neuron every neuron can watch the real world it has to watch the real world in order to get the data to figure out what the next prediction should be so it goes out there it boots up and it says Okay, Satori Network, what do you want me to watch? And the network says, why don't you watch ABC 
data streams and trying to predict them. And it says, all right. So then it subscribes to those data streams and starts saving that data and, and so that it can make a model. Mm-hmm. And every time it sees something new, that's more data that it can use to make a model of what's going to happen next. So it starts watching it, starting to get a feel for what it does. And then as every time it sees more data, it broadcasts out a prediction, right? It runs that through its most recent, most recent model, the best mm-hmm. model that it's been able to make so far. And then broadcasts that prediction out. And then anybody else can subscribe to that data. Everything, the whole system works on this series of data streams, essentially. Mm -hmm. Now, that's different than what we see in like large scale AI today. All those systems are working on data sets. So ChatGPT, they take six months, they curate a data set. They say, okay, we've now curated all of human language and thrown out hate speech. And now we can train this model. And they work on data sets. It's like batch processing, right? With Satori, there are data sets saved to the local disk, but that's basically it, right? Everything is a data stream because those Mm -hmm. data sets are being added to constantly. The underlying data format is a data stream. Now, anybody can publish a data stream and we make data streams like everybody does. If you have a smartwatch, then you could route that to Satori and say, hey, watch my data. And you could be running a node, your own node that you route it to. And you could say, I just want this node to get this data and and combine it with all the other data that it can find out there and produce a prediction and understand what is this. And Satori, I guess the point of that is that Satori is a tool that you can use to keep your data private and still get the AI out of it, right? Still get the intelligence out of it. So we have that, I guess we have that option available. But if you want to make a public data stream, you can also do that. You can say, I want my Satori Neuron to publish this data stream out so anybody can predict it. And so you might get multiple predictors on that data stream and you can average their results and get an even better prediction. Yeah. So it works with data streams, I guess that's the okay. point. Okay. And <laughs> cause when you say you can hook it up with your smartwatch, my mind, okay, let me, so how, so you're saying if I have an Apple smartwatch or just a smartwatch in general, and I want to run a node on Satori network, it's that easy. Just go ahead. connect. It is that or... easy to download the node right now. It's mm-hmm. that easy. You can just download it and it'll start running. So we've optimized it in the beginning to just run. So it goes out and it just picks out random data streams from the network. But very soon we're going to launch and then we're going to continue to improve it. You can even publish data streams right now. It might be a little difficult to publish the data stream I gave as an example, uh-huh. but we're going to get there. Yeah. After we launch some point. Okay. And could you tell us what are some of the benefits for running a node on Satori Network? Yeah. So when you run a node, I guess there's probably two benefits. The first benefit is it's a node architecture. You're going to earn the token, right? So you're going to mint this token. The second benefit is your computer is going to be always churning, always making better models, always learning something new. So you're developing it's basically developing an expertise in the domains that it's predicting, if that makes sense. So these models that it creates, Mm -hmm. they belong to the node owner. They're yours, Like They don't belong to the foundation, right? Like Mm -hmm. nothing, right? So they don't get sent up to any server. They stay on your machine. If you turn it off, then the network doesn't use that model anymore. There's Mm -hmm. no way. So, your computer just provides the predictions. It doesn't provide the model. To me, that means it's building an asset. Yeah. It's building this expertise that your computer can have. And if, I don't know, if you can use that somehow, then it's an asset, right? right. Eventually, right. phase two, like way down the road, we're going to make this marketplace where 
those kind of models that have been developed hopefully can get unlocked and privately provide predictions instead of this public good that we're producing first. Yeah. But that's way down the line. So yeah. I'm not making any promises about that. But <laughs> yeah, say, <it> could. <laughs> if it's an asset, it's yours, right? So you right. get to keep that. And then the token itself gives you voting power. So once you get the token, that is how we decentralize the AI. So we've already decentralized the AI by you just downloading it and running it. We've mm -hmm. decentralized the production of the AI. Anybody can run it. Anybody can have a say. Anybody can manipulate how their neuron works. Mm -hmm. They can replace the AI engine. They can do whatever they want, right? So that gives everybody a say in the production of it, of, of artificial intelligence. But we also want to disseminate or decentralize the benefit that AI brings, which mm -hmm. is the token, right? The benefit and the control of the entire network. We want to decentralize the control of AI. So we do that with voting rights on the token. So if you get this token, you can then have a say in how the network works. And you might think, well, what would I, what would I want to say? I'm not an AI researcher or something. The fact is there's way more data in the world than Satori is going to be able to look at or anything is going to be able to look at. Even though it's a network and it has a lot of bandwidth, mm -hmm. it still doesn't have enough bandwidth to watch everything that ever happens. We need to have those that own token vote on which data streams are the most valuable data streams for the system to watch. Okay. So they would be things like the CPI number, the price of Google, all the big things that everybody cares about. Those, that's what's going to be voted up. And if you, maybe you have some niche thing or something that doesn't really drive any economy decisions for you, there's no incentive except you really like it. Like maybe you're really into the environment. You want to know the predictions of the future of sea temperatures or something, uh -huh. you can vote on those data streams and say, I want a portion of the network to go to this and understand this really well. So yeah, I, I think having that ability to vote is really important. It decentralizes the control of this network. And that's pretty cool because it sounds like to me, like if a group of people just wanted to watch <laughs> the price of Bitcoin, <laughs> like... They could just, just process that and just hopefully maybe predict in the future. Sorry, my mind is blown right now because well, AI cool idea. is, it, it's very cool. Like, I'm like, yeah. let me go ahead and run some data streams here, become a no, because this is something that, again, when it comes to just looking or, because you mentioned it earlier, our brain does always think about, man, what does it like five years from now look like? or 10 years from now, like what is yeah. this company look like from now? Or maybe if people are really into the environment, like you said, was that was our earth because the melt caps are melting and all this stuff's going on right. with global warming and global climate change and all that. So to be able to go to all these just different sectors of just whatever comes to mind, have data for that and you have AI just constantly watching that, that's just... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because in nature, the silent spring quote, what is that? In nature, nothing exists alone. Is that it? I think Something maybe. like so, that. <laughs> everything's interconnected. And so you have to be able to watch everything in order to map those, you know, uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. But once you do, you can get this holistic world model of what's going to happen in the future. And it's very robust because... Like everything hangs together here. And I think we do predict the future right now. We try. Mm -hmm. We've been, that's what intelligence does. That's the point of it from my perspective is it predicts the future. But we do it in an isolated fashion because we're humans and we don't have this benefit of not sleeping, not eating, and just focused on what's going to happen. But computers can do that. We, we do it in a different way. We do it in an isolated manner where we only take into account what we can and we, we don't have a lot of bandwidth, so we can only look at a few things and understand their relationships. But if you can automate the system, 
then it can look at so much more than we can take into account. So anyway. Right. And because I was looking at your guys' roadmap, obviously you guys are thinking very long-term. Could you tell us not too much, but just dip into kind of just each phase that you guys are trying to be like, okay, like by 2020, because I see you guys going all the way up to 2030. So if you can just get like sprinkle up, okay, 2025, 20, 26, 27, this is what we're going to do. And this is where we see the project at. Because I feel like for me, especially being like the investor mentality as well, this is like a project that you want to just like watch over time to see how big the community gets, how many people become nose, and then obviously how you guys update on your sides. Yeah, if you could just give us some more yeah. sprinkles there, that'd be you. Totally. So those dates, I don't know. I don't know if those dates are right. I think maybe <laughs> they could be pretty correct. I don't know. But who knows? But I can say from a conceptual level, we're in phase, we've mapped out like where we want it to go. Like how long it takes to get there, we don't know. But we can say this, we're in phase zero right now, and we're almost at the end of phase zero. Phase zero is we build it, we build the prototypical MVP the, the simplest version of this that can work, right? Mm -hmm. And we have that. It's, it still has some little things we're tweaking before launch, but phase one starts at launch. When we launch, we then try to scale. So phase one is all about scale. And it says, we need to build this world model that we're talking mm -hmm. about to become a future Oracle. And that is called the public good, right? Because it's all for free. So you're... We're having people download the thing, run it, and building this world model. Okay. So that's phase one, is just scale to, the, to get to the point to be a future oracle. Mm -hmm. Phase two is, okay, now add on a... Once you've, once you've gotten to that point, you have, you have basically grown out there in the computer ecosystem of all these worldwide networks all these computers around the world, they have all these little models that are really good at predicting specific things in the context of other things. And they're all connected up to each other. <clears throat> so when you get to that point, you've basically grown this computerized expertise. This, And that's labor, right? Mm -hmm. We've grown yeah. this AI labor pool, essentially. And we can then bring that labor to market. So we can say, we can put on another layer on top that says, look, if you're a private actor and you're happy that we're predicting the CPI number for you, and but that's, it doesn't tell you what your sales are going to be next month. Why don't you send your data, your data stream to Satori nodes that are really good at understanding your industry? And they will make a prediction for you and give it right back to you, not broadcast it out. It's a private, so it's a private marketplace, essentially yeah. a marketplace of prediction. <clears throat> Sorry. Very good. <laughs> um, so that's phase two is build the private marketplace. And so now that will allow companies, individuals, like we talked about the smartwatch that will allow companies and individuals to just say to the Satori network, Hey, you understand what's going on in the world. Why don't you de-silo my data, combine it with everything else that's out there. And instead of, I saw this in business intelligence, because that's where I started programming. Mm -hmm. I saw that I might have some people that are like, hey, business intelligence team, why don't you come over and tell us, give us some insight about our data. And we'd be like, what do you want to know? And often people didn't really know what they wanted to know. And once we got them that answer, they'd be like, oh, that's not quite answering the question for me. Maybe I want to know this. And so what, one thing I realized was that you can bundle up basically all of the insights that somebody wants out of their data as a future prediction of that data. If you can just tell them what it's going to be in the future, that'll answer 80, 90, maybe 100% of their questions. I don't know, but it's a lot. So I see it as like a generalized solution for business intelligence as well. So I think companies will come and say, de-silo our data 
connect it in with everything else that you're watching and then send bundle all those insights up that you're going to get and just send it back to us in the form of a prediction. And that's the prediction marketplace. That's the whole idea of it. And I think that's a big deal. I think it's a big oh, yeah. step because the public good is our primary concern, but the prediction marketplace also increases the efficiency of the economy at the local scale rather than at the global scale. So because of that, I, I think it's also needed. You need this public private ability to really get the efficiency that we're looking for. Gosh. Okay. So that's phase two, phase three, and I'm sure these will start to overlap each other. Mm -hmm. So phase three says, if we get to the point where we've created this world model and we've been able to use it on a centralized or sorry, not centralized, but a platform that can allow anybody to get private predictions, then what are we going to do? Like after that, what else is there to do? Mm -hmm. And my attitude is there's nothing else to do, but continue to decentralize everything. So that is phase three. So phase three is meant to just never end. Like mm -hmm. the Satori Association, just that's all they're doing for the rest of forever. <laughs> so I don't know. I think that's a good <laughs> idea. A lot of things that, that allow you to be more decentralized are hard to do when you haven't scaled. So that's why it's continuing on after the scaling has occurred. So that's basically the three phases. Oh, there's something else that I wanted to mention. That I mentioned how the underlying data structure of the whole system is data streams. Mm -hmm. And once we get to the point, like the most recent data is the most valuable data. That tells you the most about the near future. So once we get to the point where we have this private prediction offering and anybody who's been making these models can then use them to make private predictions as well. Um, once we get to that point, it feels, it feels like it will attract data streams. Everybody's talking about, okay, I want to, I'm a habit. I have an AI, but everybody has the same data for this AI, like a large language model. We've gone out and we've curated the English language for this large language model. And now we, but our competitors have been able to do the pretty much the same thing. And they have a data set that's very similar to ours. And I think data streams are going to become more valuable than data sets in the future because our English language is evolving. So you're always going to want an updated data set. And that's mm -hmm. basically a data stream, right? So you're always going to be rebuilding your large language model anyway. So I think data streams are really the foundational data structure of reality, honestly. So they're what's valuable. And when I see that Satori will be in this position, I think it'll be able to attract living data streams that people care about because people are going to care about, Hey, what's, I'm only going to ask the Satori network to predict what I care about. Mm -hmm. Right? So we already know these are data streams that are valuable and important to people by definition. They wouldn't bring it to Satori if it wasn't. <laughs> so it's, I, I just, I think it's going to be really good, but we're focused not on the, not on the private offering. We're focused on the global offering first, right? We want to make the best global future Oracle that understands our civilization and our planet and everything about earth the best we can. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Cause now you got me thinking about all types of different data that I actually want, you know what? I feel like it's going to make people, like you said, not only evolve, but just be not, I feel like be more curious about certain things or things that they're already interested in. So now if I have like my AI buddy in a sense where he could just, yeah. I can just feed him all this data and he basically spits out, oh, this is what you need for this. Okay. All right. Let me go ahead and implement this. Oh, I got you this. So it's just 
the whole concept and idea of it is just really neat and I feel like it's something that I've really never heard of or even came across. So for me, this is, oh man, like, <laughs> I'm over here thinking like, like the only it. thing I ever think about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is, this has been really just a great opportunity to get to learn about Satori, get a little more inf- insight on how AI and blockchain can be merged into one. And the fact that again, the whole main focal point is again, making this whole decentralized platform because at the end of the day right. especially if you're gonna be feeding all this data and that's another thing you're feeding the data so people are sensitive about their data and that's how that's why i had brought up that question earlier because we've seen it happen time after time and it's probably going to continue yeah. to happen time after time but obviously now that yeah a project like yours could break that barrier and now you can have an AI that predicts data stream models for you. So depending yeah. on whatever background, whatever industry you might be in, there's going to probably be something there for you, which is cool. And that's yeah, going to attract a lot of people. It can be under your desk. It doesn't have to be. I think these AI agents, these LLMs are coming fast. You'll have, like you mentioned, you have your own little thing you can talk to and that knows you. And it's customized for you, completely customized for you. But you know what? It's going to be provided by a centralized company and they're going to have that AI living on their servers. And it's convenient. You're going to, you just pick up your phone and you don't have to have a a rig that's running this model or whatever. But Satori is something that you can, if you have sensitive data, like your biometric data, your spending habits, Mm-hmm. If you want to just hook it up to your own node, you can use that as a tool. And I do think that's really important from the beginning. Even if you don't want it to broadcast that data out, you just use it as a free tool. Like it's just there for you. That's yeah. something that people should really take into account because again, you can use this same example when it comes to centralized exchanges. I've seen it time after time. We can drop names if we really want to FTX, Binance, some other CX out there where they're at any given time. If you feel like you want to go get your money, <laughs> they lock you out. And I've seen it happen. I actually been a part of it with Voyager back in the day, but that Oof. was my lesson. Yeah, <laughs> that was my lesson learned. And it was like, now I really just operate on Dex. Why? Because again, they're decentralized and that's the, again, main point of getting into the space is because I don't want somebody that's in control because once somebody's in control, yep. that's where it gets nasty and people yep. get frustrated. And just like you said, centralized organizations are going to see this idea. If not, they already seen it and they're going to want to use it and they're going to feed it to people. And it's like, people, you guys are just falling into the same trap. Again, if yeah. it's not your keys, not your wallet, it goes all back to that. And I hope people that are watching and listening are really taking that to account because that is very key. If it's not decentralized, it ain't really crypto, man. Like that's right. I look at it. That's right. Do you got do we gotta decentralize all the things? And so I think it's really important to decentralize future intelligence to decentralize intelligence through future prediction right right and oh my we're about to be running out of time here folks i didn't even, i didn't even see this we've been having such a great conversation here i uh, hope you guys are really enjoying it looks like we're about to be wrapping up here as far as jordan i want to say again thank you for coming on to the show if there is any of the things that you would like to leave for the audience people out there listening watching um, by all means well, just thanks for having me on um i would say satorinet.io is the website if you don't want to download it right now you want to wait for launch no problem just put in your email and we'll just email you or you can listen to us on twitter mm-hmm. so yeah all right again guys this is jordan miller satori lead developer of moon tree i mean he has brought us a lot of knowledge. Now I'm hoping you guys really pay attention here because <laughs> I learned something. And I'm very excited. If you guys can't tell, so I'm definitely you gonna catch me probably on Satori Network because now my mind's spinning about just building some different data models and having AI just 
be like that assistant. And guess what? That assistant, you don't got to pay him for anything. That labor he's doing, it's all, hey, it's all part of the mall. It's all part of the system. It just, it just runs. So appreciate y'all listening, tuning in. Again, I am your host, The Wolf of Crypto. This is Jordan Miller. Again, check out Satori. I'll leave all the links and all the information where y'all can find that easily. Other than that, till the next time, y'all, take it easy. Y'all been watching the Wolf Crypto Podcast Show. Peace. Thanks.